firstly, uh, everybody welcome. Uh, thanks for joining again. Uh, so my name is Kristaps. I'm the product owner of UGCS, web planning software here at SPH Engineering. Uh, and I'm joined today by uh, Mike Knox, who is the UAV technologist at uh, Rahul Global uh, Networks. So uh, hi, Mike. Uh, so then, um, let's maybe, while some people are still joining, let's maybe do a bit of uh, housekeeping here. So about the webinar in general. Uh, so duration is uh, approximately one hour. Um, we'll see, maybe including a Q and A session, maybe we'll go a bit uh, above that, a bit outside of that. Uh, the recording of the webinar will be sent to all of those registered afterwards. So in case at some point you have to disconnect, have to do some other things, then don't worry, uh, you'll be able to rewatch it later on. And uh, yeah, also, if you have any questions uh, during the webinar, please make sure to put it in the Q&A. So in Zoom, there's dedicated the Q&A section uh, for that, so that uh, we can either answer some of them during the webinar or uh, sort of after the presentations in the Q&A section. Uh, so for today's topic, as you know, so we'll talk uh, about planning long corridor missions in UGCS. And so first, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about in general. So what's new in UGCS? What is it for those of you who are not yet familiar with uh, doing flight planning in UGCS? And then uh, after my presentation, Mike is going to take over and talk uh, about a bit more practical things and his experience in using it. And I think you can find what he's going to talk about quite interesting. So uh, then without further ado, I think we can get started with everything. So in general, just a quick uh, introduction on what is UGCS for those of you not familiar with that. Uh, so UGCS is flight planning software for uh, desktop, so for uh, Windows and Mac computers. So it's desktop based and installs locally. What's also important here is that UGCS can be used fully offline. So also this is uh, the case often for Mike, who's flying in areas where there's essentially no uh, internet, no mobile coverage. So uh, UCS allows you to uh, either import maps as well as elevation or simply catch uh, the maps and elevation uh, from uh, internet to offline so that uh, wherever you are, you'll have access to doing the flight planning there. Um, we, from our company as well, have been uh, planning and executing flights in very remote areas, such as Greenland, Papua New Guinea, where there's uh, yeah, no internet at all, and so GCS is a lifestyle really in those situations. Uh, the single area you can um, catch for offline use, a single area is can be up to 100 square kilometers, and you can have multiple such areas uh, cached for offline use. So um, also another thing while a lot of pilots are choosing to use EGCS is because of our terrain following. So uh, you can follow terrain either according to the uh, default SRTM4 terrain elevation data or using uh, your own uh, digital elevation or digital surface models. Uh, so we also have a bunch of different flight planning tools. I'll show them to you in just a moment in the software demo. But uh, essentially we allow to plan flights for LiDAR for photogrammetry missions. We have also tools for planning uh, vertical inspections, like the ones which you can see here, as well as, of course, the main topic of today's webinar is planning corridor uh, missions. Uh, we're also multi-platform, so this means we support uh, different drones from different manufacturers, which includes uh, DJI, that this would be um, most of our user base. But then in addition to that, we also support uh, drones based on PX4 as well as our developed platforms. Uh, I know for, for those of you from uh, the USA, if you're applying for some government projects, then also uh, we support uh, many drones who are in the blue uh, list of USA government, meaning you can use EGCS for getting these government contracts and flying uh, the, the drones in those cases. Uh, so I already mentioned about custom map and digital elevation model import. And one thing, uh, one final thing I believe I didn't really mention yet is that with the GCS, you can create routes from KML or uh, CSV files. So this means that in case you have some uh, routes, specifically in this case, longer corridors uh, available in a KML file, you can import them directly into GCS and create routes from those. And also today I'll try to show you exactly how that is done. So um, 
Then uh, just one slide for those of you familiar with GCS, so maybe you have tried it at some point or maybe you're an active user. So as you know, currently in the uh, latest two versions, so uh, 4.15 and 4.16, there's been some quite, uh, I'd say, exciting changes. Uh, number one is, so now we allow to connect drones directly to GCS from DJI Pilot 2. So this means that drones such as uh, Matrice 300, M300, uh, the uh, DJI M30, as well as Mavic 3 Enterprise drones, so all of these can now be connected to GCS using uh, DJI Pilot 2 rather than GCS for DJI as it was before for the M300 drone. So hopefully uh, that make, makes things a lot easier. Uh, for especially for pilots with uh, Mavic 3, Enterprise, and M30 drones. Uh, so, yeah, looking forward to seeing your feedback on that. Uh, we also added the ability to set the initial speed when moving to the first waypoints. Now you can specify at what speed should the drone move. Uh, so those were two changes in the previous version, so 4.15. And so now, um, well, at the end of last week, we released the uh, newest version, which is EGCS 4.16 in which we finally added uh, automatic uh, ladder IMU calibration segments for the DJI L1. So these you can in fact see here in the image. So these blue points of the route, so these are the calibration segments. So in case you're flying with the L1 or with any other LiDAR, so now you have this new function. And also another long awaited thing was that we finally added official support for the FreeFly Astro drone. Uh, so uh, again, those of you flying with uh, FreeFly drones, so I hope quite, quite the good news. Uh, so yeah, those are the main things which are new in the newest version of EGCS. So I think now we can uh, move uh, further to the presentation. Uh, next one will be uh, connecting, like I mentioned, so we now have the ability to connect drones from DJI Pilot 2 to EGCS. And so this is just, uh, I hope you can see the uh, GIF, by the way. Let me know if there's some problems. But essentially, it shows how you can do that. So effectively, you find uh, the IP address of your computer within UGCS, so you just press on connect DJ Pilot 2, it shows the IP address, and then you, uh, when you have both devices on the same network, you go to Pilot 2, you input that address of the computer running UGCS, and voila, uh, it automatically connects, and you'll be able to see drone uh, telemetry, so you'll see where the drone is exactly on the map, and as well in Pilot 2, you will be able to see all the routes that you have planned for that drone platform uh, and others supported in Pilot 2. So you'll be able to see that in the cloud tab under roots on the Jet Pilot 2. Uh, so that's uh, regarding that. Let me know if you have some questions about it. And then just very briefly about different supported drones. So like I mentioned, we support the M300, M30, and Mavic 3 Enterprise, as well as many other older DJI drones, such as M600, M200, the Mavic 2 series, Phantom 4, uh, DJI Inspire, and then uh, from non-DJI drones, we support uh, Autel, although for Autel, I have to mention, this is through a root export to KML, and then also we support FreeFly Alta X. Uh, in this list, you don't see it yet, but also the FreeFly Astro drone I mentioned just now, and then uh, others such as Watts Innovation Prism, uh, drones by Inspired Flight, since they are uh, PX4 or uh, Artipilot based, and also we support various other drones which are based on the Artipilot and PX4 platform. So this includes uh, multi rotors, fixed wing drones, and even helicopters. Um, since uh, actually, in fact, GCS, what does it mean? It means universal ground control software. So in fact, since the very beginning, we have been focused on making sure that different drone platforms are supported. Uh, so specifically, more kind of going back to the topic of this webinar is regarding corridor inspections. So what tools we have for that? So some of them I mentioned, some of them I didn't. So I'll just kind of quickly run through them. And uh, yeah, then I'll also uh, show the software demo after that. First, we support uh, root creation from KML or uh, CSV files. So when you're creating a new root, you can choose to either create the new route from scratch or to uh, already import it from an existing KML or CSV file. Um, next, we also support the import of digital elevation models or digital surface models, uh, which can be collected either by uh, different sensors, such as LiDAR sensor, or also simply can be downloaded from uh, open and available databases. Uh, then next, also, uh, like I mentioned, we support map and elevation catching for offline use. There, the single area can be uh, up to the size of one square kilometers per area, and you could have multiple of them cached on your computer. 
Uh, and then, of course, uh, we support uh, creating two types of different corridor missions, one for uh, mapping and then one for uh, LiDAR use. And also we support corridor emission splitting. So you can select any point of the corridor and split it into two. Uh, you can also reorder segments easily in GCS. You can convert any route to waypoints and also you can split and merge routes. So uh, with that said, uh, let's maybe now move into the software demo and let me show you kind of what it's all about and how it practically works. And then already after that, Mike will be uh, sharing his presentation. So I just stopped the screen share for just a moment. So now, uh, first, I want to open up uh, Google Earth so I can uh, show you, uh, well, basically, how uh, how are the camel files looking in here? Although I'm sure, of course, you know it, but just so you can see so kind of from where we can start and how they look like in EGCS. So I'll now share uh, the screen with you. So soon you should be able to see Google Earth screen. And let's wait for the screen share to load. And there we go. So I, I hope you can see it. Uh, I'll maybe just open up uh, the... Uh... Oh, uh, one question I see. So is DJI Pilot uh, for Phantom 4 RTK supported? Uh, no, but for Phantom 4 RTK, you can use our Android app, the GCS for DJI, available on the App Store. Uh, so now uh, you should be able to see my screen. So this is the uh, Google Earth that I'm showing now. And you can see I have created uh, two uh, KML files here. So I have two of these uh, paths. Uh, if you want, I can also now create more, but I think for now, at least the idea is clear. So then from Google Earth, uh, I have exported them. So you can, sorry, this is Latvian, but uh, I hope you understand the idea. So essentially you can export them. Although I assume in your cases, in probably most of them, uh, you would have the KML already available from some other source. So here I'm just showing that as an example, you can use the KML, which you can also create in Google Earth or any other uh, GIS software. You can export that, and then you can move already over to uh, GCS, where you can import this. So now I'll, again, just stop the screen share. Let me switch on over to GCS screen, where I can then show you uh, a bit more of, uh, of how this works. So now let's uh, share the screen with you guys. So you should be able to see it now. Uh, so you can see I already have a corridor mission planned here. Uh, I think now we can do a few things. So first, I'll show you how you can create a corridor mission from scratch. And then next, I'll show you how you can uh, import it from a KML file. So I think here actually maybe uh, what makes more sense is I'll create a completely a new mission for you. And so now let's start from the you know very beginning. So uh, we can go ahead and select the create a new route from scratch. Now let's click next. Then next option is we just need to choose what drone are we using. Next again and click on OK. So then you're presented with a list of flight planning tools here and you can choose to use one of the two corridors, either a normal corridor mapping or doing a LiDAR corridor. So in this case, I'll, for now, I'll choose the LiDAR corridor. And so now what I can already do is I can hold down the shift button on the keyboard and simply click away, add a few um, approximating points for the corridor, and then I just press on the enter key to complete it. And now after that, I'll be able to make uh, more kind of adjustments for fine tuning it. Currently, you can see I have so one um, line going in in the forward direction and then two lines also kind of coming back so three lines in total uh we can also decrease this so we can change easily the uh width of the corridor so i believe now uh with 100 meter width you can see there's one line in each uh direction here also we can see so this is the new feature where we have the automatic uh calibration uh patterns well automatic calibration segments uh for the dji l1 as well as other lidar sensors uh, so now this is at least the initial corridor. So now what you can do is you can make some more fine tuning adjustments. So you can grab any of these points here in the middle and you can adjust them. So in this case, uh, this uh, appears to be some river. And so then we can plan the corridor so that the drone would be following uh, the river in the flight. So essentially you can make as many of these adjustments as you need and adjust your corridor mission. So. Uh, then, in addition to that, you can add different actions here. So, for, ex for example, now you can see we have the set camera attitude action, 
And in addition to that, we can add, for instance, a set camera by distance so that every certain number of meters, the camera will be triggered. And if we check here, then you can see actually the parameters for set camera triggering by distance. So how many shots in total will be taken, uh, how many meters, so how often will the camera be triggered. Uh, moreover, we can go here into parameters, click on show elevation, and so now you can see the elevation profile, which we can also uh, expand so you can see it in more detail. And so here also you can now see the total estimated duration of this corridor, uh, total estimated distance, duration, uh, waypoint count, as well as the altitude. So this is how it looks now. So this looks, uh, I think, quite good. And then a few more features which I can show you uh while we are here so then also you can take any of the points of the corridor and so let's say if you for example think okay maybe it makes sense to uh split this corridor into two so you can easily do that you can simply select this point here then right click and then select uh split and so then once you do that you can see now you have two separate routes so two separate corridors you can also select corridor number two and for instance we can make some more fine-tuning adjustments if we need. And then already after that, uh, yeah, if necessary, of course, you can also split this corridor again, or if, for instance, you realize, okay, I want to uh, combine them again together, you can either use the undo functionality of UGCS, or you can simply go here, then select merge, and then select the other route, choose whether you want to add it to the beginning or to the end, and then you can select uh, merge. So that's just one way how you can use the uh, this functionality here in GCS. Uh, what's more is also for any of uh, these corridors. So for now, let's hide this one. Let's, for example, select only this. You can actually also uh, transform it into waypoints. So what you can do is you can go here into parameters and then click convert to waypoints. So now uh, GCS creates a separate uh, route, which is only uh, waypoint. So this means that now you can, for instance, do things such as let's say select this waypoint, and then if, for example, you want the drone to fly somewhere out and essentially fly a corridor within a corridor, so now what you can do is you can go here, again, for instance, add a new weather corridor segment, and then you can add this within this part of uh, the other corridor, click on OK, and so now let's just wait for this to be calculated. So. This is just one way of how you can use this functionality so that you can create uh, corridors which can branch out. Uh, you don't also necessarily need to convert to waypoints. You can also simply uh, take one corridor mission, split it into two or multiple, combine them, and then also rearrange however you need. So the software offers a lot of customizability and a lot of adjustment when it comes to your route planning. That's why a lot of our pilots are also using this specifically for cases when they need to fly these more complex routes. Uh, so, and also uh, I did mention that you can use uh, custom digital elevation models, digital surface models. And so this is all imported here in the map layers window. So here, this is where you can import different map overlays uh, using add function. And then you can select a GOT file, which you can import as the overlay. Uh, similarly for the elevation, you can also do that um then what else so yeah for the offline maps you can select a certain region of the map and catch it for offline use so for this you can for instance select let's say this uh region and hit enter enter some name for it and then click on create now that specific map region will be cached for offline use and will be available later for uh flight planning when offline uh, then one kind of final thing that I want to show you here before we go on over to the uh, part where uh, Michael will be talking. And uh, I see there's a few questions, so I'll see. Maybe I can answer them after my part, or maybe we just answer them uh, at the very end. So now the next thing I wanted to show you uh, is uh, importing the routes from KML files. So uh, these corridors here, I have been just, you know, as you saw, creating myself. And so now I just want to show you how you can import them from KML. So this is done in the following way. You can go here to add a new route. So we can, for instance, call it uh, KML1, and then we select import from file. Now we can go and browse the file. So both of the corridors, which I had in uh, Google Earth, so I can now export both of them to the KML files. I did that before the webinar. Uh, but so then 
for example, you can select uh, the first one, then hit on select. And so you can see here that the GCS offers uh, two different options, how you can uh, import. Well, in fact, more than two, but essentially uh, the linear string segments or any linear segments of the KML file, these can be imported as one of the four segments, either as waypoints, as a mapping corridor, as a vertical scan, or as a LiDAR corridor. And then for um, what's called linear ring or for polygonal segments of a KML file, you can choose to import them as an area scan for the gram tree, perimeter, or a LiDAR area. So for the, um, in this case, we have only a linear segment of the KML file. So here I can, for instance, choose to import this as a mapping corridor. Now uh, we just need to click here on next, then choose what drone we'll be using. So in this case, we'll be using the DJI M300 drone. Then we can click here on next. And so then you can see, so this is the corridor already imported in GCS. This is the exact same KML line, which we had uh, in Google uh, or so you can take any KML, import it into GCS, and GCS will essentially just crunch it up, convert it into root, which you can then already upload to a drone. Uh, so here also, let's maybe take a look at some of the uh, detailed data of this corridor. So you can see here, the total estimated distance is 16 kilometers, uh, duration about one hour. You can see the waypoint count, how high will the drone be following and the terrain. And so here you can see that the minimum altitude will be about 27 meters. So for the photogram tree, you're setting the altitude using the uh, GSD. So in this case, I'll maybe increase the GSD uh, two times. So I'll increase it to two. And so now already the uh, corridor should be higher. So now you can see that the corridor height is from 55 to 57 meters. Another important thing, which I can show to you now, is that you can actually adjust the uh, AGL tolerance of the corridor. So currently I have it set to one meter, which adds waypoints essentially every one meter of uh, change in terrain elevation. If you, for example, don't want that many waypoints, I believe actually the default value here is uh, three, so I can change this to that. And so now you should see that there are less waypoints added. And uh, this also means the drone will follow the terrain less accurately. So you can essentially adjust how many waypoints you want there to be and how accurately you want the drone to follow. The terrain, but I think uh, values from starting from the default value of three to a more accurate value of one uh, should be good at least to start off with your flight planning. Uh, and then also, of course, also you can add the uh, set camera by distance action or set camera by time action, depending on your preference. Uh, similarly, the corridor here can also be split. So you can again just go on any of these points, then we can. Select split, and so now we have two separate corridors, uh, which we can then already uh, operate with uh, separately. These also you can hide or show, depending on what you need. Uh, and then, for instance, if we also want to add the other KML file, which we have, then we can go here on Add New Root. Again, import from file, browse, and then we have the second KML file, which we had there in Google Earth. And this, again, I'll import as a mapping corridor. Click on next, then select the M300. And then also this has been imported. Uh, the parameters, you, you remember in the previous one, I changed the GSD uh, to, uh, from one to two. So you can see that it actually remembers the parameters you had in the previous one and it uses them already in the next segment that you import. So if you have adjusted this, then uh, yeah, or the next corridor will have uh, correct parameters. And so then here, for instance, if you want to, you can combine corridors together. You can also adjust their width. So currently, they're only uh, one line in each direction. And so I believe now if we change the width to, for example, 80 meters, oh, maybe might need to change this to 100, then we should have, uh, yeah, so now we should have two lines, so one line in each direction. And we can do the same thing here. So we can also here change the uh, width of the uh, corridor for the uh, both of the KML files of the KML corridors, which are named KML, I mean. Uh, and yeah, so that's essentially how uh, you can plan corridor missions from scratch in EGCS and also how you can import them from, uh, from KML files. Uh, now let's just briefly jump back, uh, jump on over back to the presentation, uh, just so I can finish uh, every, with everything that's on my side, and then we can move on over to uh, Mike's part. 
So I'll just stop the screen share briefly and let's relaunch the slideshow. And then I will reshare the screen with you guys. So you should now, now you should be able to see it. Hopefully, let me know if there's some uh, problems. Uh, but yeah, so that was the software demo. Uh, in case you're interested in something more, uh, seeing some more videos of flight planning uh, with UGCS, or maybe even interested in um, some personal demo, having some call with us, we're also uh, always open for that. So, you know, just drop us a message. Um, and um, yep, so if you want to try the software and you know, maybe you have not yet uh, had a shot with UGCS, uh, then you can uh, scan the QR code that you see here or just go to the site gcs.com slash pricing, and you can then sign up for a free 14-day trial. Uh, then you can download and install GCS, uh, connect your drone, and you can already get started with planning your corridor missions. Uh, so yeah, that was gonna be the next step there. And uh, if you have some questions about what I showed you just now uh, for uh, as far as you know, the corridor flight planning goes, um, remember, so this webinar has a Q&A section, so just feel free to leave some any of your questions there. Uh, so I'll see you. during Mike's part, probably I'll be answering the questions which are there already now. And uh, yeah, so um, I think then on my part, this is probably it. So yeah, uh, I just want to say thank you guys. Uh, and so now I think let's move on over to Mike's part where uh, we can talk a bit more about the practical side of things and using GCS in real life. So Mike, are you ready? You bet. Thanks for the introduction, Christoph. Uh, my name is Mike Knox and I'm with Roll Global Networks. We're a company that's located in North America. Uh, we're in Canada and I'll just get my presentation started here as well. One moment. All right, if you can see my screen. Uh, so this is introduction to myself. And as we move along here, it's uh, great to be with you guys. Uh, I've spent 17 years with this company called Roll Global Networks. And currently I am a UAV technologist with them. We are uh, specialized in utility infrastructure. And this is our company branding in colors that normally we would see in blue. We have offices currently located in North America in three locations, uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Winnipeg, Manitoba, and Jupiter, Florida. Our company was founded in 1967, and to date, we've installed over 20,000 kilometers of fiber optic cable. We employ a turnkey design with build and maintenance in all aspects. And so you may be wondering, why are we talking about this company? Well, we're talking about it because of the use of design. And throughout our history, we've been working in design stages. And as many have evolved from traditional GPS ground survey, uh, we have progressed as well into doing drone mapping and drone survey. And so we come from our past being established in those eras to our current situation with spreading across North America and to our future and operations of consistent investments in technology, as we all must keep up, and into a premier brand of turnkey design. Our company is based on several teams. We have construction crews, managers, splicing technicians, drafting technicians, which are the ones working with all the data that we provide, our field managers, crew supervisors, and operations teams that are building networks, and we coordinate and work with many various groups of individuals. Uh, First Nations in Canada, we're doing a large program, currently building fiber optic networks. And we bring this to our last part, which is our drone side of things today. We've come to grow into an advantage utilizing drones that has provided the ability to uh, create construction drawings that are improved or the sense of just a blank white background that typically used to be seen in a set of drawings. So we are currently employing the use of our data to not only be measurable and accurate to be able to draw, but also to have updated and current imagery in the background that can be used by everybody from the design stages right through to 
the field supervisors who hold the plans in their hands and kind of see and situate where they are. Currently, Roll actually has carrier services that we provide internet services for in Northern Canada, uh, stemming from Atchison, Alberta, which is, which is near Edmonton, uh, up to Fort St. John, BC, and as well into high level. And some of these services actually provide uh, internet all the way to the Yukon, and it's going to be part of uh, our presentation and how we arrived here today. So our, our past highlights, we've, we've had several uh, opportunities that we've worked with energy and installations. We've developed fiber optic routes along the Alcan, which is the Alaskan highway that borders um, through Canada going up to Alaska. We've built long haul networks all across Canada and fiber optic builds throughout uh, First Nations communities with thousands of kilometers to date. We've been partnered with major several brands of telecommunication providers in Canada that include Shaw, uh, Bell, different inst institutions. Brings us to today, our webinar, Long Corridor Mission Planning. So today we're talking about more of a practical side of things. Uh, I appreciate the uh, reach out from UGCS and just communication with them through the last few years and using their flight program, which it speaks for itself. Uh, Christoph's highlighted on several occasions just the ability and demonstration of how it's able to be used. And we could talk a little bit more about that, but that's the reason why I have looked at it and been able to um, utilize it in various aspects that were described today. So today's topic, we're gonna look at just the, the brief uh, discussion of pre-planning, mission planning with UGCS, our pre-flight setup, flight mission, our post-mission, post-processing, and gets us to our final deliverables. Long corridor missions, so the, the topic today. Well, I recently, uh, part of our construction projects that Roll has ongoing, we are working along what's known as the Dempster Highway. And the Dempster Highway is a 740 kilometer uh, journey from Dawson City in the Yukon, up to the Inuvik, which is in the Northwest Territories of Northern Canada. And it provides un unbelievable scenery and spaces. So Roll Global Networks, being a turnkey in uh, telecommunications, has been part of the design and build and maintenance of this project. And that's where I came in. I came in to assist in getting some of the information and in getting some of the imagery to help uh, assist in, in the already existing uh, survey that was completed, but also just in all the stages of our project planning and uh, mapping and routing and some design changes. And in total, this was a 774 kilometer uh, project that I flew the drone through. This is a screenshot here of um, where it's located in Northern Canada and the distance that it involves. And so one of the first things that we have to ask ourselves is what is our desired outcome? What are we trying to achieve? So that may come down to what your clients are looking for or what an in-house program is it that you're trying to achieve? Is it just current imagery of the location, whether we're just doing photogrammetry? Is it elevation profiles and digital terrain modeling or contouring so that we understand the ground beneath and the earth beneath where we're working. Uh, all of that's taken into play so that you can assess the situation and know what your desired outcome is. And so we take that on, we do a field survey, we do the safety and analysis and regulations for your region. So we're on a worldwide platform today where everybody's in different parts of the world and your own regulations will come into play. Today, I'm talking about North America and in Canada specifically. Looking at logistics when it comes to long corridor planning, you know, taking on a venture of 774 kilometers is, a, is kind of a big uh, situation. Fortunately in this, uh, our company has stationed accommodations along the routes so that we're able to work to and from. But that's part of the planning stages of when you take into uh, long corridor projects is like, how will you access the location? How will you 
um, get the necessary equipment and supplies in? And what type of equipment and supplies are you going to need? So just more of the practical side of things. And so looking at that, uh, we had to plan for working to and from distances of several days. Lots of days we were traveling 200 kilometers by vehicle in order to get to our work location for the day. And so it's, it's planning in and amongst that throughout uh, all the efforts. Reaching into mission planning with UGCS, Christoph did a great job today showing you just some of the practical steps of that. But covering that side of things is you got to know your drone. You have to know what it is your drone is capable of doing, what are you capable of doing, and what are you legally bound to have to do. And you can go through the steps like Christoph showed of creating a new route. And in that route, you can either choose import or create it from scratch. You have to set your parameters accordingly. And in the first uh, opening of your route selection, you can see where it is you can specify certain uh, parameters. One action that I've often chosen is to, if you lose connection with your drone, is to continue the mission. And in doing so, the drone, because it's predefined and it's following waypoint to waypoint, it will continue on as if nothing wrong had happened. This is one of the highlights of UGCS that has been instrumental in uh, pulling off a successful completion of such a long work. Here's some of those further parameters is knowing the specifics of how long should you even plan to fly. So you can do a simple uh, calculation of, you know, take your flight time, which is your battery time per minute that your drone's capable of, multiplying that by 60 seconds and your flight speed that you're trying to uh, travel at. And so for example, the DJI M300, uh, approximately 26 minutes is where I have typically used it to, to fly. That's with payload and considering uh, startup takeoff time, that's a safe working time that I've come to realize. And just doing that simple math. So with that, with a flight speed of nine and a half meters per second, it's capable of flying around 14,000 meters, which is 14 kilometers. That's uh, something good to know as you set up your, your mission. The next thing is how many passes should you make? Uh, it depends on what you're capturing. It depends on what your deliverable is. But again, it's knowing that you need to think about your end deliverable. So two passes that I found to be optimal in getting the most data that's gonna work, if you're doing photogrammetry especially, to having overlapping imagery, to have sufficient overlap so that the programs that we use in our uh, processing stage are able to actually match and calculate those tie points. Setting up our route specifics, you can change, like Christoph showed, the width. So when you adjust for width, you uh, here, you can adjust the number of passes that you make. And these are all camera specific. And all those algorithms are inputted into the drone's information. And so you select your camera, you select knowing that based on what it's capable of so that you can actually um, continue on with, with what you're trying to achieve. Ground sampling distance, you can set and not adjust the altitude that was mentioned. Set your forward and your side overlaps. And again, the above ground level tolerance AGL is the reason why we moved towards UGCS right away, is that we needed a system that could follow terrain when we're working in creating scalable maps. You need a drone and a system that's going to follow the earth below so that everything stays in proximity and creates the correct outcome. Setting your camera angle, um, depending on what you're utilizing. Most often we're shooting in Nader, which is straight down or 90 degrees. Some of the uh, route specifics, just things to think of if you are out there and looking to start planning for long corridor flights, is just some of the details that could help. Uh, part of that is in route naming. So I like to do sequential naming where I actually number my routes. Um, I like to go, as you see up here, 001, and I just follow sequentially. And that gives me the added ability just to lay them all out in order 
And then you can quickly go back and forth. And I find that it works well right through to the processing stage where you're doing data management, that everything is defined and simple that you can uh, continue on to find what you're looking for. Considering all our airspace and obstacles, you know, whether there's towers, whether there's mountains, uh, the terrain elevation and changes, some of the practical side of things is planning your takeoff position. You know, this work was done along a highway uh, or a corridor, which was a uh, roadway. And sometimes when you're actually designing the route, you would want to plan where your takeoff point is. And you would choose maybe it's by an approach or maybe it's by a little bit wider section or practical speaking, it's in a long straight section versus being on a curve where uh, visibility or other vehicles may be a concern or an issue. These are all just considerations. Create and edit your corridor waypoints. After you've created your route, you can adjust them quickly and easily that Christoph showed as well. Planning your end of your route. Um, one thing that we've come to utilize is utilizing ground control points and knowing where your end of your route is, is, is important so that you are placing ground control points and the drone will actually turn and make it over that to capture it in its, in its uh, data acquisition. The next would be um, the overlap. And that's something to consider with, uh, so that you have proper overlap from section to section. And I'm talking about probably roughly a hundred meters or so, so that the process at the end deliverable you have enough coverage that it matches when it comes together and it'll show that accordingly. Uh, one of the things is to visualize the terrain. So I've got it marked here and we can maybe show that in the end, but you can actually scroll down within UGCS and see if it has elevation data involved that you can visualize the terrain. So you can know whether your route um, is gonna be visible if you're planning a uh, line of sight and you're doing a stationary uh, takeoff and move from that single point, are you going to actually be able to visualize and see the drone from that point? You can actually tell that from within the program of UGCS. And next is working in remote regions is caching offline maps. This is, this is huge and this is incredible. The G UGCS, uh, within the last year, I believe, recently introduced the selection of what Christoph showed of creating a cacheable area that allows 100 square kilometers to cache offline. That is key when working offline, to have your elevation, your, your locations um, cached in the background so that when you're out in the field, you can work as if you were right online, which is fantastic. Next slide, just showing a setup here. This is along the Dempster Highway uh, in the Yukon. And this is a mission that we had set up for, and we're um, capturing photogrammetry data as well. At the time, we had an interest in thermal data. So we're using the H20T on the uh, DJI M300. And so just doing a pre-flight uh, setup. So you're gonna wanna check the, all the regular things, your equipment checklist, your ground control points, your pre-flight safety survey, which we're doing a scan of the area. So if you have your predefined route and planning is all done, you kind of know what you should be getting into. But once you get into the field, you want to look and see what is it like in the real world? And you may encounter things that you're like, oh, that, that never showed up on Google Earth. And that's part of why we're doing this job is Google Earth imagery could be five years, 10 years out of date. Uh, so we're trying to get out there and see what is in the surroundings, what's going to be in that flight, so that we know exactly what we're up against. And then we can make our route adjustments as necessary. It's great to have a pre-flight checklist and then we're ready to start setting up for the actual flight. Let's talk about GCP distribution. Um, you hear a lot on the internet about whether you should or you shouldn't use it, whether it's even required. We're flying RTK or we're flying PPK capable sensors and gathering data. That data is accurate. That data is within a few centimeters most times. And if you're only trying to get relative information that you don't have to pin it down to 
where it is in real earth or your deliverables and what you're trying to achieve, it doesn't really matter, then maybe you could get away without GCPs. However, if you're trying to do any type of mapping, any type of surveying, GCPs will ensure the accuracy to get the survey grade deliverables that you need. And so layout, layout's important. On these long missions, um, we would lay out roughly every one kilometer. And you may need to experiment for yourselves what works for you, but we were uh, achieving flights on this project of linear lengths of around seven kilometers. And so we would lay out seven to eight GCPs per flight. One at the beginning of the route, one at the end of the route, and then a kilometer space between. And often we would uh, set up our base station and units as well. And we would just, for ease of use, lay one beside it and away we would go. Again, GCPs bring in that survey grade that you need in order to actually pin it into what it's gonna be on a georeference system. Flight mission. Once all those other things are set up, ground control is laid out, we're getting ready to actually fly. So you will, again, like I mentioned, have to know what is the regulations for your region? What is it that you need to be aware of? Um, for our region in Canada, one of the things is that the pilot needs to be in control of the unit at all times, visual line of sight. And one way that we've been able to work within this is on these uh, areas, we're flying in uncontrolled space a lot of times. We do encounter uh, controlled airspace, and then we, we work with the proper authorities and planning that's necessary. But uh, a way that we've been able to achieve long lengths is by actually driving and flying. And so with that, we have to have two people crew, minimum. One as a driver dedicated to the safety of the vehicle and the road, and as the pilot being the visual observer as you actually lift off and drive and fly. We've been able to utilize this method safely and create our own procedures to follow that accordingly. And it's been very uh, consistent and actually I believe very safely done and effective in that the drone, at least working along roadways, you're able to maintain visual line of sight at all times. And you're staying within, you know, uh, maybe 300, 400 meters, 500 meters from the drone. It gives you a good visual view when you're looking through the front window. So this is a view in the bottom left corner of uh, setting up with two remote controls. One is operating the flight uh, control system with UGCF, and the other one is operating just the camera control, which is uh, an option with the M300 that you can actually have a gimbal operator and a flight operator uh, to utilize. In this setup, you, you can't see, but we're also utilizing a laptop with UGCS on the desktop, and you can maintain and monitor all the flight parameters and specifics as it goes. And it seems to work really well. So now we're ready, we've, we've executed, we've uploaded our route, we're performed our pre-flight inspection of the drone, and we're ready for liftoff. And so we would, lift off um, safely, making sure no vehicles or other people are around. And then we would follow the drone as it's in motion with the vehicle until it reaches the end of the route and then simply turning around and following it back to its takeoff position. You can monitor it quite easily in this, this way. And it's just, now you have a system in place, it's a matter of repeat, repeat, repeat. And so away we go and we continue to gather all the data. Post-flight, so we've gathered that data. We, it's important when you're flying, obviously to keep good records and maintenance, uh, keeping a log flight, that'll help you in tracking your sequential order of your routes as well. And it'll help you in uh, any backend work just to know how much time is on your drone, what kind of maintenance that we need to do what batteries did we use and having a sequential order of that just to have a good maintenance program in place. We can confirm our flight data and then we just continue and repeat each day. At the end of the day on these missions, we were typically flying six to seven flights, capturing six to seven kilometers of flight, roughly 40 kilometers a day was our targeted goal. 
And on this project, I believe we took about 21 to 22 actual flying days to achieve almost 800 kilometers of linear project, which was a feat in and of itself. Post-processing, this is where we started and are asking ourselves what's our final deliverable and knowing what our outcome that we're trying to achieve. And it's up to you with what software or what cloud software processing equipment that you're using. Um, but knowing what you're trying to get in the beginning will help you through these stages. And so this is just an example uh, of a detailed dense uh, sparse cloud here and showing our GCPs space throughout. Here's an example of a digital elevation model of the varying degree and just a simple snapshot of a Nader uh, looking down photo collected along the way. Our final deliverable. Well, we achieved what we did. We gathered our data, we processed it, and now we're ready to import it, whether that be into CAD or some other uh, sketch program and utilize it in the way that you see fit. For us in Roll Global Networks, it's building fiber optic networks. That's our in-house program. That's what we've been specialized in doing. And we utilize this data to help assisting in the drafting and the design and then the drawing of what it is that we're um, gonna be building and laying in the ground. A simple picture here of uh, being along the Dempster Highway, looking at the beautiful scenery, it was a great place to work. So not only does this information provide you deliverables, but it provides you data to aid in environmental monitoring. Um, it's often used as a way to look back to see change over time. We can use it for improvements in traditional ground survey and design, and we can use it through our operational stages. Now our crews and project managers and all that circle of design has the ability to actually utilize this data and see the imagery, see the background, and make the best routes possible for what we're trying to achieve in construction. In conclusion, I just want to thank uh, UGCS. Roll thanks you on behalf of us. We were, uh, you know, grateful for the opportunity just to share some practical insight, some experience, and if we are able to uh, assist others, you know, let us know. You can reach out as well. Our experience has shown that UGCS has made it possible to properly plan, confidently fly a drone through challenging terrain large-scale projects, small-scale projects, offline, remote locations, we're able to collect valuable data that produce accurate and measurable results. And I know you guys are here today, I'm sure, because you may have the experience of UGCS, but we're grateful that they have built a platform that is able to accomplish the goals and tasks that if you're a drone pilot or a company that's looking into this, that has the ability to, to do that. So on behalf of Roll Global Networks, uh, my name is Mike Knox. I appreciate the time you've given us here today. And uh, if there's something in North America that we're able to reach out and give us an opportunity, um, by all means, reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for your time. All right, Mike, thank you so much. Uh, it was really interesting for me as well to uh, listen to your presentation and uh, yeah, especially seeing uh, all the uh, images from the field that you took, uh, super beautiful locations to be working in, I think. For sure. Um, now, I think uh, maybe let's take a look at, we have some questions, and I think maybe while we answer some of them, uh, just in case some of, some of you maybe have some more questions, something you want uh, either me or Mike to answer, to either about GCS or, uh, you know, more about practical uh, use of it and using it in the field, collecting the data for corridor inspections, uh, make sure to ask them. So like I said in the very beginning, so Zoom has a uh, Q&A section. So just make sure to add your question there and then we can answer that. Uh, so then uh, let's kind of go through the questions one by one. So the first one is, so how long uh, might it take you to actually to survey those uh, 700 uh, kilometers? Yeah, it was I really mentioned so. Yeah, yeah roughly yeah. about a, uh, I was in the location for about a month, um, but it was about 21 to two days of actual capture. And like mentioned, we were, our target goal is about six flights a day, and it's roughly an hour to do that. So it would be about a 30 minute 
drive set up, placing ground control points, um, and then surveying those. And then it would be about a 30 minutes when you take off, lift off to touchdown. So in my flight logs, it's just line by line, repeat, repeat, and it's almost to the minute, an hour per section. Um, I have actually a question there also kind of from more practical uh, point of view. So when you're flying in those locations, those distances, so where do you, for instance, for those 21 days, where do you typically spend the night? Like, do you sleep in the car or in a tent or how do you do it? Yeah, no, so great question. Um, typically we would, if there is accommodations, we would uh, book and utilize accommodation. So some of the locations are towns, uh, Dawson City was one, we would stay in a hotel. Because we are a construction program and maintaining and doing construction along this specific location, we actually had uh, man camps set up, which are trailer units. And they were spaced at like two to 300 kilometers. So there's a lot of travel involved uh, in order to accomplish this. And so sometimes you would spend three to four hours driving to and from location. So two hours in the morning to get there, two hours return. The other way, if it accommodates, would be mobile accommodations, perhaps um, pull a camper, take a travel trailer. Uh, that would be another way to feasibly set up where you work and just move each day. You know, some, some of the simple logistics, but. We were, we were so far, like from where I live, it actually took me five days of travel to get to this location. I, wow. live, in, I, I live in central Canada and it is uh, 4,500 kilometers from my home to the starting point of this project. And I spent about four and a half days travel just to get there. Wow. Oh my God. It's, the scale is also a lot bigger than Europe. You know, here it would take us probably half that just like to go from like uh, where we are at least in Latvia to, like the south of Europe so essentially right. it would be like you know going there and then back again not just for you going to the starting location yeah R really really impressive um, and uh, also one another question for me so how did you solve then the uh, battery charging situation. So how many batteries did you have with you? Did you use a separate generator or um, how did you solve that? Yeah, that's the practical side of things for sure. So we we uh, we utilize pickup trucks, um, and then I always have a generator. And so I have the M300 with four sets of batteries. So my battery bays are full. And but with an onboard generator in the vehicle itself, we're able to maintain our entire electrical system, computers, uh, Wi-Fi routers, and battery charging and maintenance of all our devices because of that generator capacity. And so literally it's just running uh, to keep charging everything. Um, and by the way, you, so you mentioned, uh, so before the webinar started when we were uh, chatting for a bit, you mentioned that you um, have some, uh, came up with some solution for the uh, Wi-Fi networks to use EGCS. So uh, as well, some, many of you guys know, uh, so for GCS, to, for in the field, we always recommend to use some dedicated Wi-Fi uh, router for that. Even though you can uh, catch the routes for offline use, uh, you can also just like load them on the mobile controller. So in fact, you don't even need to take the laptop out. However, when you need to make some adjustments to the routes, or if you want the flight to entry to be logged, that's when it comes in handy to have some Wi-Fi device to be able to connect the uh, drone smart controller uh, along with the laptop. So what kind of uh, router setup do you have uh, in the field? Yeah, so um, a lot of the new vehicles now actually have personal hotspot or routers built in. Uh, sometimes the safety protocols on those don't allow connection to UGCS through the server. So I just use a, a typical uh, standard home router. Originally, I, I had a small travel router, but I was having difficulty with connection dropping and it was just a communication issue because of the device itself. And so when I upgraded to a better, just a home style router, it's not using any internet capability whatsoever where we are. It's just simply the pass-through information that's required to connect UGCS desktop to the uh, UGCS DJI pilot app on the, on the smart controller. And having that was a stable connection. And so that, that made a game changer for 
quick connection on startup. I used to have trouble with uh, getting connection with the drone and the controller and my desktop laptop. I would, it would sometimes lag and take a long time, but that was more equipment and hardware related of the router itself, which was solved by a better unit. Yeah, I think that's actually a, a miscon, like, um, I would say, uh, a common misconception that uh, GCS always requires internet connections. So it's not the case. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can have some local network without the internet just for connecting the devices. So that's what also we recommend pilots in the field. So in many cases, uh, you know, you can use, let's say, if you're just flying in the city, you can even use like a mobile phone hotspot. But when you already get to those remote areas where, you know, you might not have internet, um, some mobile phones, they still do support the having some hotspot uh, open even with no internet. For instance, when we were flying uh, on in our campsite in uh, Greenland, Again, no cell coverage, but we used uh, some Android phone. I think it might have been like a Samsung S6, uh, I believe, uh, through which we basically connected everything. And even with no internet, uh, the it, it was working for us. But with uh, many other phones, including iPhones, for that matter, if there is no uh, internet, if there is no LTE coverage, then the hotspot won't work. So in those cases, it's good to either uh, load the routes on the uh, mobile device already before that, or to have some uh, quick router in the field, which you can use to connect both devices. Uh, so, but uh, and then putting that topic a bit aside, uh, then maybe let's kind of proceed to go through the questions. This so next one is, um, it's about, so do you use, uh, it says GPS, as maybe, maybe it means uh, ground control points. So, uh, so ground control points uh, when receiving RTK corrections, from a, a course system, well, I assume uh, RTK over network. So if I understand the question correctly, the question is, do you use ground control points when receiving RTK corrections from uh, the uh, RTK over network system? Yeah, so in our region where we were working uh, so far north, there's very limited core stations, which is the uh, the correction services that are provided by a, a, a known base point. And so we were flying in this circumstance with the um, DJI RTK2 as our base unit. And we were flying connected to the drone in RTK fixed positioning. That I saw later uh, in one of the questions as well it could be that how do you maintain connection? And we would maintain connection by setting our unit in the middle of the road. And we experimented and through experience have realized that getting that far away from the drone, um, if it's several kilometers, you could jeopardize losing RTK connection. And it's best suited to place and take off in the middle of the road, fly to one end, fly all the way past your takeoff position, get to the return end and then back again to your takeoff position. And that has the best chance to maintain RTK fix. And uh, it has served and worked well, but that's also where I talked about visualizing your terrain. So if you're working in um, hilly terrain or hard bends or mountainous terrain where visual line of sight is gonna be blocked or impeded, you may need to shorten your uh, run lengths in order to accommodate for that slightly. But the other, the other thing is, is you may lose RTK fix slightly for part of the duration, but that's also the redundancy of having ground control points is that that will allow your uh, end result of processing to take that into consideration and to pull everything in and, and place it correctly when you're utilizing ground control points. Okay, I think that uh, answers probably that question. And what, it's really interesting to also mention how, uh, yeah, the idea of essentially to be, be able to keep connection to the drone to so basically take off from like the middle of the corridor and yeah, so then fly to the one end and then fly all the way back to the other one. It's also maybe some really interesting insight from uh, from the field and some more practical applications. Um, in fact, actually speaking of the field, so this is um, not in the Q&A, this is just uh, a question in the chat. Um, so a bit 
further away from drones, more about the environment where you, where you were flying. So the question is, what kind of wild, wildlife did you encounter along the way when you were there in the field? Yeah, some incredible scenery, uh, beautiful mountains, rivers. Uh, I encountered several uh, different types of wildlife. Um, there's caribou in the region. Um, we were in times where we never saw large herds of caribou, but I did see several single caribou. Um, there's moose, big bull moose. It's a big bull moose that with antlers um, and grizzly bears. I actually encountered uh, several occasions of, of seeing grizzly bears and, you know, they would be off in the distance. Um, again, in this particular format of driving and flying, your safety is a little more uh, uh, <laughs> relieved when you're in a vehicle, but, you know, yeah. you're not trying to disturb nature and wildlife and what we're doing. So, and then there's all kinds of ground birds. Um, they call them uh, like ptarmigan are up there and uh, grouse, lots of spruce grouse, different types of grouse are along the way. So very, very interesting for sure. Even in some of the creeks and rivers, they're so clean, they're so crisp and clear that we could see grayling fish just swimming in the rivers just by looking down overhead if we were stopped along the way. So yeah, it's, it's quite, quite beautiful. Oh, so that's actually really amazing. Sounds like I should visit the uh, north of Canada. Yeah. Hopefully yeah, one sure. day. Um, okay, then uh, let's just go through some other questions. Um, just a second, I think maybe the one question is on one of the photos you had the DGI RTK base station. When have, uh, where uh, have you placed the base station in relation to your seven kilometers segments? So I think this you kind of answered. So yeah, basically the base station was in the middle of those segments, yeah. if I understand correctly. And right. so during the flight, then uh, you were staying uh, put kind of in the same location where you had the base station as John was flying. And then after the flight of the one corridor segment, you basically just moved on to the next point, just to kind of clarify yeah, we, that. We would pick up and move the DGI RTK2 for every flight. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's where this particular situation with the H20T, it doesn't have the timestamp logging of now the P1 does to do PPK. And so our goal was to try and maintain RTK fix. And, uh, but then we utilized ground control points and GPS those ground control points. And we would correct that data um, to, to, to create in our end deliverable. Uh, okay, so I think that also answers that. Uh, then another question is, so I think it's also maybe a bit related. So yeah, the question is, so Mike, you mentioned that you did uh, six to seven flights per day, uh, totaling 40 kilometers. So each flight was about seven kilometers. But there, earlier you said that you did uh, 14 uh, kilometers. So did you do two passes? But I think also you can answer this. So essentially you do a few passes in each location just to you know maintain uh, the correct overlaps. Okay, so this one also was then answered. Um, and uh, yeah, I actually think that's uh, it as far as all the questions go. So I think we can probably start to wrap up uh, the webinar. So I just want to uh, say a big thank you, uh, Mike, for uh, joining and for telling uh, about your experience applying those in those areas. I think it's super interesting to hear, uh, especially in the more remote area, usually it is the more interesting it is to listen about uh, different jump out experiences there. So yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you for sharing. Uh, for uh, anybody who uh, is looking for some work to be done for uh, corridor surveying in uh, North America and especially Canada. So, you know, you have uh, Mike's contacts, which were in the presentation. Uh, in case you missed them, we'll also send uh, the link to the recording after the webinar, so you'll have access to that. You can also reach out to Mike uh, directly or uh, also here, of course, what you have on the screen, so you can also uh, get started with UGCS in case you have not already. And yeah, so I think then that's, uh, that's it. Let's wrap up. So yeah, thank you, everybody, and uh, hope you enjoyed it. And thank you, Mike. Take care, everyone.